Welcome back to another top 5 video. Today we're going to be focusing on what I think are the top 5 rarest German World War II planes that actually flew. The key factor for a plane to have made its way onto this list is that it actually has to have flown in real life. It's nice to look at planes like the Messerschmitt Me P1101, a fighter aircraft prototype that was around 80% completed before its capture, but it never flew under its own power, so therefore it can't be on this list. Another example of these kinds of prototypes is the Messerschmitt Me 329. It was a planned heavy fighter. Only one partial wooden mock-up was built. It's yet another example of a neat plane that never flew. Anyway, let's get on with the list. Number 5. The Heinkel HE-119 The Heinkel HE-119 was designed to be an unarmed reconnaissance bomber, the design of which began in 1936. The aim of the 119 was to have a fast plane that could recon the enemy and outrun their interceptors. To achieve high speeds and good visibility, the designers at Heinkel decided to forego the typical cockpit design. The cockpit is located directly behind the propeller, inside the main fuselage. The power for the propeller came from two engines near the centre of the plane. A drive shaft going through the middle of the cockpit transferred the combined power to the single prop. The shaft was shielded so that the crew was not at risk from injury from moving parts. The 119 is not the only plane to not have its engine located near the propeller. The American P-39 has a similar idea. The engine is mounted near the center of gravity, which is located behind the pilot and in between the center of the two wings. The two engines of the 119 could produce a beastly 2,350 horsepower, giving the 119 a top speed of 590 kilometers per hour. It's funny to think, but when I first saw a picture of this plane, I thought it was a single seater. I thought the pilot had to lie down on their belly to fly the plane, kind of similar in style to the Blomenvoss BB-40 or the Arado ARE-381. I was wrong, it's a fairly big plane. Just a tad shorter than the Heinkel 111 bomber, the main German medium bomber throughout World War II. Three crew members could fit inside the 119. The pilot and co-pilot would sit in a standard configuration, side by side, in the cockpit. An optional rear gunner would be manning two rearward facing machine guns, one gun facing above and one gun facing below. An exciting feature that made the HE 119 unique is its cooling system. The 119 forgoes typical radiator cooling for a more experimental type of cooling, evaporation cooling. Steam is produced when cooling the engine, the steam travels down pipes that channel it into the wings. Inside the wings, the steam cools down and turns back into water. The water is then pumped back to the engine for the cycle to start again. It's the same system that was used on the Heinkel 100. In theory, this method of cooling is very good, but on the first 119 it was found to be inadequate, so a classic radiator had to be added. Steam cooling is rather complicated for the amount of slight performance increase it gives. I can imagine it's why the Heinkel 100 wasn't mass produced even though it had better flight characteristics than the BF-109. One small hole in the wing, and the engine will seize up within a few minutes. In total, 8 Heinkel 119s were built. The first model built flew in 1937. The first two 119s had a fairly standard configuration for general aviation. The third 119 was fitted to be a seaplane. It had large floats installed allowing it to take off and land from water. The fourth 119 was similar to the first two 119s produced, with the exception of a bigger radiator. It went on to achieve a record flight where it carried a 1,000 kg payload over 10,000 km at a record max speed of 505 km per hour. The last four 119s had more military application. They had upped the crew count from 2 to 3, and also defensive machine guns were added as a last resort. The 5th and 6th were for reconnaissance, the 7th and 8th were for bombing, they could carry up to 1,000 kilograms of bombs. The German Air Ministry wasn't too interested in the planes, despite all the different prototypes made showcasing their different uses. They were sold under a plan for licensed production, production of which never happened. But what did happen is that the designs were used when designing the R2Y. The R2Y took heavy inspiration from the 119. Only two R2Ys were made. Number 4. Mistel Planes it refers to refitted planes that are converted into glide bombs that are deployed from planes. The idea was for a small plane to guide in a large payload towards the target. When the payload was on its final dive to the target, the pilot could detach and fly back to base while the payload crashes into its target. The mistletoe planes normally had a fighter on top and a medium bomber underneath. 
This wasn't always the case, as there's some experimental variants of these planes, but we'll get to those later. Mistletoe planes are rather similar to a concept used earlier in the war. The DFS-230 assault glider will be slung underneath a Fokkerwolf FW-56 or a BF-109. It's surprising to see a tow plane fixed to the glider in this configuration, then well, towing it in front. The DFS-230 glider could carry a crew of 9 men. For a plane to be correctly classed as a mistletoe plane, the plane below has to be powered, otherwise it's just a very large bomb. The most common setup for these planes was to have a Yonkers Ju-88 below and a Fokker Wolf FW-190 above. The Ju-88 will be filled to the brim with explosives. If available, a special nose cone which was fitted with explosives will be fitted to the Ju-88. Take a guess how much that nose cone weighs. Go on, take a guess. Was your answer close to 650 kilograms? It's a shaped charge that can penetrate up to 7 meters of concrete. The pilot in the plane above was able to control both planes in flight. The control surfaces for the smaller plane were mirrored onto the bigger one. The pilot could even change the engine speeds of the payload. For longer missions, a pump could be added to transfer fuel from the tanks of the plane underneath to the plane above. When the mistletoe plane was close to its target, the planes were detached by the pilot detonating explosive bolts which held the two planes together. The glide bomb would then continue on autopilot. Experiments were done to have the bomb plane radio controlled. These radio controlled variants were only experimental and were not used en masse. The first mistletoe plane flew in 1943. 250 planes in this configuration were built before the war's end. Their success in combat is a mixed bag of results. The overall result was that they were not good. The nature of the mistletoe planes are that they are very expensive but fairly accurate. This means they can only be used on high priority targets and not wasted willy nilly. For example, mistletoe planes were used in the defense of Berlin. They were targeted at bridges that were spanning the Oder River. That river was the last major defensive line before Berlin. It was key for the defense of Berlin to be able to destroy those bridges to halt the Russian advance. Other uses of the mistletoes were against the Allies in Normandy with the attempted destruction of Corsair sur Mer, a harbour in northern France allowing the Allies to easily bring in supplies for their forces. Both of these mistletoe attacks did little to no damage relative to what was expected of them. Any set of planes can be configured to become mistletoe planes. There were plans for more experimental variants. These included the TA-152 with a Fokker Wolf 190 underneath. Another proposed variant was a HE-162 or Arado-234 with an Arado E-377A glide bomb. The E-377 was a custom purpose glide bomb. It could hold just under 2 tons of explosives. Even though the 377 has no cockpit, it still counts as a mistletoe. This is because it uses its own engines as well as the planes above power to get to its target. There was even thoughts of using an ME-262 with a stripped out interior and turning them into glide bombs. They would be slung under another ME-262 which would fly them to their target. The major issues with mistletoe planes is that they are very expensive and vulnerable to attack. Planes are fairly expensive to make. The most difficult part of the aircraft to make is the engines, and with each mistletoe bomb, valuable airframes with expensive engines are being wasted. Engines can only be made in specialised workshops and involve Pacific engineering. Defensive capabilities in the air were non-existent for the mistletoe planes. Maneuverability when joined together was not good, making them very vulnerable when en route to their target. Once the mothership plane drops its payload, it gets back its normal flight characteristics. The footage in the background is filmed by American planes intercepting mistletoe configured planes. Fighter cover was necessary or it was more than likely that the piggyback plane would not make it to its target. Sometimes fighter cover was not available or simply the target would be out of range for normal fighters. The mistletoe project was a result of a country losing a war and needing a way to repurpose its older equipment for short term needs rather than long term. Early in the war, Germany was launching V1 rockets from Heinkel 111s. This seems a lot less wasteful. Over 410 V1s were launched from planes. Most of them were launched at London, which is a rather large target. The V1s wouldn't be used on specific important targets due to accuracy issues. A few mistletoes were actually built with piloted JU-88s for long-range Pathfinder missions. The Fokkerwolf 190 was simply taken along for the ride. When an enemy plane was spotted, the FW-190 could separate and engage. 
This mothership plane concept is not the first of its kind. There were experiments done by the Russians with the TB-3. The TB-3 would be the mothership that would carry fighter planes over long distances to a combat area. In the combat area, the smaller fighters could detach, and when their fuel ran low, they could hook up again with the mothership and return to base. A little bit of trivia that I'm going to add before I move on to the next plane is that the Fucker Wolf 190 in the London Science Museum actually has mountings for the explosive bolts that were used in missile planes. It's funny to think how most people seeing this in the museum wouldn't realise that the plane actually had a special purpose other than being a fighter plane. Number 3. The Blomenvoss BV-155 The Blomenvoss 155 was designed to be a high altitude interceptor, with bombing raids increasing in frequency and with America entering the war, Germany was harassed by daytime bombing by America and nighttime bombing by the British. Several high altitude interceptor programs were set up in parallel to each other, leading to some innovative designs. I could dedicate a whole video just talking about these types of planes, experimental planes like the Messerschmitt ME163 and the Backham BA349. Also, there's more practical high altitude interceptors like the Dornier DO335 and the TA152. But let's not get sidetracked. Originally, the BV155 was being designed by Messerschmitt. The 155 went through rough development hell. Originally called the ME-155, it was being designed for the one aircraft carrier Germany was producing, the Graf Zeppelin. The plane was designed to have a tail hook in order to make it carrier operational. The carrier was cancelled nearing completion due to shift in war priorities. The plane was then redesigned to be a high speed tactical bomber that could carry a single 1000kg bomb. It got redesignated as the ME-155A. After that design was rejected, Messerschmitt was asked to make a high altitude fighter, so the plane was redesigned, giving us the ME-155B1. After some more back and forth between the German Ministry of Aviation and Messerschmitt, the plane was redesigned with a supercharger and a slightly enlarged fuselage to accommodate it. This gave us the ME-155B1A. <laughs> That's a mouthful. In 1943, the German Ministry of Aviation decided to hand the project to Blomenvoss as Messerschmitt was working on a lot of projects already. With the design in Blomenvoss's hands, it was renamed to the BV-155. Blomenvoss got to work with the first variant of the BV-155, the BV-155V1. Messerschmitt was supposed to still co-work on the project, but Messerschmitt was not too happy with losing their contract, so what ensured was some back and forth passive aggressiveness. Examples being missed meetings and generally being a pain in the ass to communicate with. It also didn't help that Messerschmitt's office working on the 155 was based in France. I'm sure there was some distaste for working with Germans. The first variant of the BV-155 for V1 had an issue of overheating. Blomenvoss's solution to this issue was the installation of two massive radiators under each wing for version 2. This is easily the most prominent visible feature of the BV-155. It was a necessary addition for the massive amount of heat the engine was producing for the extra performance. When the design was being produced by Messerschmitt, there was a plan to have eight small radiators, four on each wing. Blomenvoss opted to simplify the process by having two large radiators instead of eight. If you're wondering why the 155 looks very similar to a BF-109, that's basically because it is a 109, just one that's gone through extensive upgrades throughout the years. The armament of the BV-155 was a single 30mm cannon in the nose and two heavy machine guns mounted in each wing. It also boasted some pretty neat features for a 1944 fighter. It had a pressurised cabin and an ejector seat. The total amount of 155s built may vary depending on how you count it. Three of the 155s actually flew, but a further two of them were almost completed but not fully assembled. So it can be argued that five 155s were made. Work on the plane's design was still being done in 1945, with B&V working on a third variant of the plane. The facilities where the 155 was being developed were captured by the British. Only one example of the BV-155 still exists, and it is held by the American Air and Space Museum. It's not on display, and most likely never will be. Number 2. The Heinkel HE-162 The HE-162 is a small, single-seater jet fighter its name was Volksjäger, which translates into English as the People's Jet. This jet was designed to be small and easy to build out of relatively simple and available materials. Most of the airframe is made out of wood, 
It was a deviation in German design direction which typically had most planes metal skinned. Perhaps it was a lesson learned from their enemies, the British and the Russians. Both the Russians and the British were short on aluminium so they had to resort to using wood for plane construction. Examples of mostly wooden planes would be the British Mosquito and the Russian Lag-3. The HE-162 was born from the Germany Emergency Fighter Program which was a program to develop planes that could take on high altitude bombers. In the past, the German Air Force preferred heavy twin engine planes to engage allied bomber formations. These heavy planes could be armoured to protect their crew and could carry large amounts of heavy ammunition for large calibre guns, ideal for bomber hunting. Without air supremacy, these heavy planes were very vulnerable and easily intercepted and shot down before engaging their intended targets. An example of a heavy interceptor would be the Heinkel HE-219. These large planes were also very expensive to produce. In comparison, the Heinkel 162 was meant to be cheap and easy to manufacture, so cheap that it would be practically disposable, at least compared to the ME-262, the ME-262 being Germany's main jet fighter at the time. The unique design of having a single engine in the middle on top of the main fuselage allowed for easy engine maintenance. Late war German jet engines had a bad life expectancy due to a lack of rare metals and poor quality control during assembly. Engine lifetime was usually around 10 hours per jet engine. All the BMW 3 engines were frozen with all of their design flaws for mass production. One example of how lack of metals affected manufacturing was with the internal design of the jet engines. Normally they will be made of aluminium, but due to a shortage of metals, the internals of the engine were made out of iron with a thin layer of aluminium sprayed on the inside. With engine lifetimes like this, the old engine could easily be switched out by a crane in a workshop and a new one put into its place. At ground level, the 162 could do just under 800 km per hour. At 20,000 feet, it could do around 850 km per hour with the added benefit of engine efficiency. Flight time was around 30 minutes at ground level or closer to 90 minutes at higher altitudes. In the event that the pilot had to bail out, an ejector seat was available. The reason for its inclusion was to ensure that the pilot cleared the area around the jet engine which was located just behind the main cockpit. There were two variants of the 162. The only difference between these two types is their offensive armament. The ME-162A1 had two 30mm cannons. The ME-162A2 had two 20mm cannons. The variant with 20mm was mass produced as it was found in testing that the 30mm caused damage to the plane from their recoil. A unique feature of the 162's design was to have the wingtips droop down at the tips. The reason for this is to decrease stalling speeds at low speeds, thus making it easier to land at lower speeds. It may be a tiny plane, but surprisingly with its max fuel load, its weight will be over 3 tonnes. The 162 had light armour in the nose and bulletproof glass aimed at protecting the pilot from a bomber's defensive armament. One thing that I should add is that the 162 had retractable landing gear. It may not sound like a big deal, but for German late war plane design you'll be surprised how many prototypes and mass produced planes flew with no landing gear. The ME-163 had to land on a skid. The BA-349 broke in two in midair and the pilot had to use a parachute while the engine of the plane fell back to earth on its own parachute. The ME-162 is not exactly rare as 300 of them were made, but I think it deserves a place on this list. Almost none of the 300 saw combat. It is said that the 162 resulted in a grand total of one enemy plane shot down. And even for that one plane that it shot down, there are conflicting reports on whether it happened or not, and if the credit was actually by flat guns on the ground. For a plane that almost had 300 of them made, there's almost no footage of it available and that is because the video recordings of the plane's test flights were destroyed before the war's end. The jet's name in English is People's Fighter. Just how Volkswagen was meant to make simple cars that everyone could drive, this jet was supposed to be easy to fly by new recruits in Germany's Air Force. This couldn't be further from the truth. The 162 had flight characteristics that even seasoned jet pilots struggled to overcome. The high speeds necessary for landing were a big hurdle to overcome for new trainees on the 162. Mass manufacturing started just after January 1945 when the war was already seen as lost. With the first production units getting to squadrons in February, it wasn't until April when the first 162s first saw combat. Most of the manufacturing of the 162 was done by slave labourers who were unskilled, dying and unwilling to work in the horrid conditions. 
They worked assembling the planes in dark, damp caves underground. Many brutal SS underground slave factories had been set up nearing the war's end. Their goal was to assemble the wonder weapons that would save the Reich. We can all see how that turned out. One story I like about how prisoners got their own back was by urinating in the glue used in aircraft assembly. The urine would cause the glue to break down over time, lowering its effectiveness. The glue was used in a lot of the assembly of planes. It's a relatively undetectable method of sabotage that would cause failure at high times of stress on the airframe. Funny thing is, is that while peeing in the glue did help it to break down quicker, the glue that was being used in these forced labour workshops was already flawed. A manufacturing plant that was producing a very large proportion of Germany's industrial glue was bombed, causing substitute glues to be used in aviation assembly. These substitute glues tended to become more acidic over time, which caused them to break down. Most of the 162s were lost due to bad manufacturing quality and not to enemy fire. Engine fires, structural failure, etc. There was a case of a 162 pilot ejecting and getting killed by the canopy not opening. Over 600 162s were in production when Germany surrendered. The 162 was thought to be the saving grace for the regime, but it went on to prove how short-sighted and desperate the Third Reich was. Large faults in the 162 were found in testing but all the warnings were ignored just to get this fighter into mass production. Production of the plane had started before testing of the design was completed. It's not unusual in war times for a design to be frozen even if there are faults. Small changes can be made but only with permission, and even then only if they're simple and will not change factory assembly lines. Normally these designs are deemed acceptable, but what's not acceptable is having the wings fall off your plane. Something is slightly wrong if that's happening. There are many 162s on display in museums around the world. Number 1. The Messerschmitt ME-328 I've saved the weirdest plane for last. The ME-328 is a pulse jet powered fighter plane. Its power plant is two V1 engines. This plane was already doomed from the start of the planning phase. There's a reason that this is the only plane to be powered by pulse jets. Well, that's if you don't count the manned V1 variant the Fiesela FI-103R Reichenberg. There was also one other pulse jet powered plane, the Yonkers EF-126, but it never flew powered so technically it doesn't count. The ME-328 was first designed in 1941, with its original purpose to being a parasite fighter. The thought was that it could be attached to heavy bombers to provide bomber cover, kind of in a similar configuration to the missile planes. When enemy fighters were spotted near the formation, the 328 would detach and intercept. There were also thoughts of towing the plane instead of mounting it to the bomber. With its wooden airframe and cheap engine design, it was thought that four of these could be made for the cost of one conventional propeller powered fighter. Early hopes were to build 1000 of these, but nothing came of it. There are many issues with pulse jets that make them not ideal for a plane's power plant. Heavy bombers normally perform their raids at high altitudes. Pulse jets do not perform well at high altitudes, so it's not an ideal power plant for a plane that is meant to be operating at high altitudes. There were several variants of the 328, with the only difference between the types being their power plant. There was unpowered glider, twin pulse jet, and the last design, single jet engine. Although the first designs were made in 1941, it first flew powered in 1944. Nine were made in total, two of them were unpowered gliders, and the other seven were powered by the twin pulse jets. The armament for a mass production variant would have been twin 20mm cannons. One of the many issues with pulse jets is that they fail quickly. They're not built to last. V1s were built to fly for just under an hour, not longer. Pulse jet engines are characterised by their simplicity, low cost of construction and their high noise levels. Another issue with the 328 project was that the pulse jets would cause so much vibration in flight that the plane would start to shake itself apart. A solution to fixing this was changing the engine location from the rear tail of the plane to under the wings. This change didn't fix the issue with vibrations, but it did help to alleviate the risk that the plane would completely shake itself apart. Like all the other late war German fighters, there was armoured plates and toughened glass to protect the pilot from a head-on attack. During the design phase, it was decided that it would be too complicated to install an ejector seat into the plane with the time and resources they had. It was easier to design a system with exploding bolts that could be detonated, removing the tail section from the plane. For landing, the plane would land on a retractable skid. 
When it was clear that this plane would not be used in its intended fighter role, there were thoughts that maybe it could be converted into a suicide weapon. In the nose, a 500kg or larger bomb could be placed. The plane could then be launched from a medium bomber, and the pilot inside the 3 8 would fly the plane into its intended target. This idea was abandoned as it was thought that it could be much more easily done by the manned V-1 variant. The idea of piloted suicide weapons was later dropped by the Air Ministry, even though there was already a squadron of assembled volunteers. When fully loaded, the ME 328 weighed over 2.5 tons. Its maximum speed was 800 km per hour, with speeds at level flight being around 600 km an hour. Nothing came of this project. In the end, focus was given to other fighters that would have more success. Well, there you have it. Those are my top 5 rarest German World War II planes that actually flew. There are tons of other planes that could easily have made its way onto this list, but this is my top 5 list after all. Leave in the comments what plane you think should have been on this list, but be warned I may have already mentioned it in another of my top 5 lists. If you like this video, I'm sure you'll enjoy my other top 5s, so you should check them out. Anyways, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed your time. Like, comment and subscribe or I'll break your f***ing legs.